Minister Desmond Lee. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank members for acknowledging the difficult but meaningful work of MSF's Child Protective Services and our social service agency partners. Uh, let me now respond to your questions and suggestions, and please forgive me if I can't respond to every single one of them. First, I note that several members of Parliament were concerned that the power to protect abused or neglected children could overly interfere with how parents legitimately discipline and raise their children. Uh, Mr. Christopher de Souza touched on the definition of emotional harm. While the concepts of emotional harm, emotional abuse or psychological abuse may seem broad or subjective, what we have sought to do in the Bill is to give as much clarity as we can on what constitutes such harm or abuse by providing some specific circumstances and then examples. For example, Mr. D'Souza asked what infantilization is in one of the examples. This occurs when parent or guardian deliberately treats a child as being much younger than the child's actual age and in a way that is not developmentally appropriate for the child. For example, say a child in upper primary school being made to wear diapers every day. Uh, he also asked about uh, the example of being confined in a small space and by that we refer to a space that is not conducive for the child's development and is beyond socially accepted boundaries for punishment. For example, locking a child in a cage, a toilet, a storeroom uh, as a form of punishment. Uh, I wish to assure members that we do not intend to diminish parental authority. We do not intend to unduly interfere with parents' rights to discipline their children. And we do not intend to overly intrude into the private lives of families. The vast majority of parents are responsible and do their best to care for and raise their children. And within the private lives of families, within the bounds of parental authority, there is a wide berth or space for parents to nurture, raise and discipline their children. The common adage goes, spare a rod, spoil the child. Unfortunately, a small number struggle to parent responsibly for whatever reason. And when parenting or so-called discipline crosses the line and becomes excessively harsh or abusive, whether physically or emotionally, uh, we, may, we may have to intervene to protect the children. I gave a couple of examples uh, yesterday. Mr. Louis Ng, Dr. Lee Biwa, Ms. Antia Ong and Mr. Christy Souza spoke about the impact of removing children from families and asked whether MSF could provide a sense of continuity and familiarity to children who have been placed in out-of-home care. Now let me explain to members how MSF handles reports of child abuse or neglect. When we receive reports that raise concerns about the safety of children, uh, we first undertake a comprehensive social investigation. Often our social services move in uh, rather than immediately the Child Protective Service. Uh, we look at factors such as the context, in intention, severity, persistence of the abuse or neglect, the likelihood of future harm to the child, and the strengths as well as needs of the families. And in doing so, we are aided by evidence-based assessment tools. Our child protection officers are sensitive to the emotions that may overwhelm the child and are trained to apply trauma-informed practices when interviewing children. We also consult professionals such as psychologists and psychiatrists when needed. The police may concurrently investigate if a criminal offence is reported or suspected to have taken place. Our efforts focus on keeping the family intact with safety plans in place. But when the home environment is unsafe for the child, MSF may have to remove the child from his parents as a last resort. We then work quickly to ensure that the child can be placed in a safe place, whether under the care of his grandparents or other relatives such as aunts and uncles, foster parents or children's home. And when the child is in out of home care, uh, these caregivers who may be extended family members will be able to make decisions for the child in a timely manner. MSF will also work closely with professionals in the child's network of support, such as school counsellors and teachers, to review the child's progress from time to time. When needed, we may 
consult independent panels such as the Committee on Fostering, which comprises a range of professionals from the relevant fields such as education, child psychology and psychiatry. We will facilitate constant contact between the child and family members where possible to maintain that important relationship. Family reunification, after all, remains the long-term goal for many children in state care. The court may also order the parents to attend counselling or other programmes to ensure the well-being and safety of the child and also make orders to assist the child in recovery. Ms. Sylvia Lim asked if there is financial support for parents to comply with the orders made by the courts. We will ensure that no family will be denied services because they are unable to afford them. For example, MSF does not charge for the services we provide to the families. Our appointed social service agencies also have arrangements to keep their services well accessible to families, regardless of their social economic status. Now I will share the policy considerations behind how we place children in out-of-home care. Mr. Henry Quack and Ms. Denise Poir, uh, for example, spoke about fostering. Family-based care is preferred as a supportive family environment will help children who have been abused or neglected. However, 47% of children in out-of-home care are looked after by foster families today. And our goal is to try to place two-thirds of such children in family-based care. So we have 47%, still some way to go. The reality is that we do not have enough foster parents for every child in need of protection. As a foster parent, you have to open not only your hearts, you open your homes. And the care is 24-7. And this challenge is especially so for older children. There are also children with more complex needs whose interests are better served in a residential care setting. Mr. Louis Ng and Ms. Anthea Ong spoke about siblings, sibling groups in out-of-home care. Sometimes a pair, sometimes many more. MSF strives to place siblings together as far as possible. Doing so preserves their relationships and allows them to support each other through difficult times. And yet, sometimes we have to split them up. We have to consider the circumstances of each case managed within the realities of our out-of-home out care landscape. The age, gender, as well as the care and intervention needs of each child, availability of foster families, especially those who can care for more than one foster child, and the resident profiles in children's homes are taken into account when deciding a child's placement. Even though siblings may not stay together in some instances, MSF and our partners will facilitate contact between the siblings as well as with their natural parents. Mr. Louis Ng also spoke about school arrangements. MSF is guided by what is in the child's best interest. Where the expected duration of the out-of-home care placement is short or the child will soon be taking a national exam or the current school provides good support for his needs, we prefer to let the child continue in his current school. If a change of school is in the interest of the child, MSF will work with the schools, the foster families or children's homes to help with the transition. In the case of Ellie referred to in Mr. Lewison's speech, the change of school was done for a benefit. The distance between the home and the original school meant very long and tiring daily commutes for her, and that showed when she returned to the home. My colleagues have recently checked on Ellie and I'm told that she's progressing well in her placement despite initial adjustment difficulties. And I think we understand that she was caught between a rock and a hard place. Her family situation was none the better. And that is why she had to be removed in the very first place. I thank Mr. Ng for his concern. We will monitor the girl's situation and work towards reunifying her with her family. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to questions relating to the ECP or Enhanced Care and Protection Order. Uh, Mr. Saktiandi Supat was concerned that it may undermine the role and standing of parents. Quite similar to the, the first set of questions that I addressed. When a child has been placed in out-of-home care, we seek to return the child back to his family as soon as possible. Caveat, if it is safe to do so. Hence, before applying for an ECPO, MSF and our community partners would already 
have sought to reunify the family. This includes providing counseling and psychotherapy, identifying responsible adults in the family to anchor possible safety plans, and preparing the relevant touch points in the community, such as schools and preschools, to play a part in those plans. In making an enhanced care and protection order, the courts must be satisfied that the child has had to stay in out-of-home care for at least 12 months for a child who is below 3, or at least 24 months for a child aged 3 and above. The parents are not fit to provide care for the child, and it is not appropriate to return the child to the care and custody of any of his parents. And I gave some examples yesterday. Let me explain to Mr. Saktiandi Supat that the ECPO does not allow MSF nor the caregivers to make decisions relating to, to religion on behalf of the child. Our practice is to try to place children with foster families of the same race and religion as far as possible, or if that is not possible due to fostering constraints, we will consult and seek parental consent. Our children's homes operate on a secular basis while providing for the religious needs of the child, including other requirements such as dietary needs. Mr. Darrell David and Mr. Henry Quack asked about fostering and adoption. While this bill in itself does not touch on adoption, uh, foster parents may apply to adopt the children under the Adoption of Children's Act. Adoption of a fostered child may be considered if it is in the welfare of the child. This is if natural parents are unable or unwilling to care for the child or will significantly compromise the safety and well-being of the child. This is a high threshold. We will take your feedback on facilitating the adoption of children in state care into consideration when we review our laws and processes on that act. Mr. Saktiandi Supat and Ms. Anthea Ong asked whether income tax benefits can be given to foster families. Uh, foster parents face caregiving challenges similar to natural parents. The childcare leave benefits that we are proposing to extend if, if this parliament endorses will give them more time to spend with their foster children. Financially, foster parents receive fostering allowances to defray expenses for the children. And the quantum is higher if the children have special needs. They also get childcare and medical subsidies to assist them. Uh, Ms. Anthea Ong and Mr. Desmond Chu also spoke about supporting other caregivers in caring for abused and neglected children. For some children whose parents are unable to provide a safe living environment, MSF may appoint relatives to provide care similar to how natural parents care for the child. And the amended uh, legislation will similarly extend childcare leave to such appointed caregivers to support them uh, in their caregiving roles. Some members spoke about amendments relating to the rehabilitation of youth offenders. Uh, let me outline our approach to youth justice and rehabilitation to set the context for the amendments that I described yesterday afternoon. Youth justice in Singapore is premised on gradated intervention. Our approach is to try to divert youth offenders, including those between the ages of 16 and 18, away from the court wherever possible. Youth offenders who are not diverted are assessed whether they are suitable for probation. Probation focuses on community-based rehabilitation and the court may order accompanying conditions depending on the needs of the youth. This means that youths who are required to reside in places of detention and GRCs or juvenile rehabilitation centres generally have higher risk behaviours, more complex needs or a weak family environment that does not support rehabilitation and that tends to manifest in their behaviour in an interaction with other people. Earlier, I'd explained that we need to strike a good balance between helping youth offenders rehabilitate and reintegrate into society on the one hand and ensuring the safety of residents and staff in places of detention and juvenile rehabilitation centres and of the public in general. So this brings me to my next point on how we seek to achieve such a balance. Uh, Ms. Sylvia Lim asked about the treatment of youth suspects and youth offenders by law enforcement officers, MSF and the courts. Ms. Lim correctly pointed out that there are existing laws and protocols that law enforcement officers must adhere to 
and handling youth suspects, such as not detaining arrested persons for more than 48 hours. Our amendment to Section 30 of the Act inserts this deadline explicitly into the CYP itself, in line with Section 68 of the Criminal Procedure Code or CPC, so that there is no ambiguity in how law enforcement officers handle arrested youth suspects. The law enforcement officers, such as the police, are trained to handle youth suspects, and where feasible, the police try to expedite the investigation of cases involving youth suspects. Police protocols also involve the activation of appropriate adults to support the emotional needs of young suspects and to ensure close coordination between law enforcement and other agencies, such as schools and MSF, for appropriate follow-up. The appropriate adults and the police are trained to look out for signs of distress by youth during the interview and can assess if the youth is in a suitable condition or state to be interviewed or not. The police officer can also decide to discontinue the interview and reschedule the interview when the young suspect is in a more stable emotional state. After investigations, a decision on whether to release and divert the youth or proceed with the charge is made. We also recognize that some youth, especially older youth, may commit serious offenses and can be repeat offenders. And this is where the public prosecutor as well as the youth court have the discretion to charge the offender in either the youth court or a court of appropriate jurisdiction such as the state courts. And Ms. Lim asked yesterday whether it's a case of discretion or whether it's mandatory when a, young, when a youth offender is a, a committed or suspected of committed serious offenses in the schedule or is a repeat offender whether or not there's discretion and answer is yes. In terms of protecting the identity of uh, young offenders, the state courts continues to be able to issue gag orders to ensure the identity of the youth is not revealed by media. The youth court in making any order must consider the needs of each youth and their risks of reoffending in future. The youth court typically calls for a pre-sentencing pre report to determine if the youth is suitable for probation or otherwise, and weighs several factors, such as whether the youth had prior offences, the youth's behaviour in school, his relationship with peers, family circumstances, the availability and strength of familial and community support are also important. Where there is adequate supervision, appropriate discipline, and consistent parenting also considered. After taking into consideration the risks and the needs of the youth, the court can order a youth offender to undergo rehabilitation under a probation order or in a juvenile rehabilitation centre. In considering whether a youth requires reformative training, the court would call for a suitability report to determine whether the youth's physical and mental condition is suitable for RTC. The youth, would also youth court would also consider whether the youth has demonstrated aggressive or violent behaviour, such as when the youth was remanded at the MSF youth homes. The youth may be assessed to have, had, to have such a high risk of aggressive behaviour that it may not be safe for the youth to be detained in the GRC, especially if it may affect the safety or disrupt the rehabilitation of other youths in the GRC. The assessment of individual levels, risk levels and needs of the youth determines the regime and environment that best supports his rehabilitation. Hence, in, in, in incidents involving more than one youth, it may be possible that the youth court may grant different orders as is needed for their rehabilitation. At the same time, parity in sentencing is vital to preserve and protect public confidence in the way justice is administered. Sir, I cited earlier uh, yesterday the case of a 15-year-old resident with unruly and aggressive behaviour. While he was at the Singapore Boys' Home, he repeatedly threatened youth guidance officers and intimidated other residents. He is burly, well-built, at about 1.83 metres tall, slightly taller than me, or a lot, lot taller, <laughs> a head taller. And in one instance, he held his dormitory uh, mate uh, by the neck and lifted him off the ground, uh, choking him. Fortunately, staff witnessed it and intervened immediately. And this is one out of many scenarios where our officers find it essential to be able to deploy the use of restraints and other measures quickly to safeguard other residents. Let me share another example. 
Members may be aware that a serious incident took place at the Singapore boys' home last year. Seven residents physically assaulted an auxiliary police officer and two MSF officers, inflicting serious injury. The auxiliary police officer suffered serious eye injury, while the two MSF officers suffered head injuries. Though all three officers are back at their workplace, we must reduce the risk of such incidents repeating. The, the, the homes are places of rehabilitation, yes, but I've described the uh, complexity and the behaviours of the youth who are, uh, are, are residing in the GRC. Uh, because it is a rehabilitative environment, we have many youth guidance officers, psychologists, counsellors, therapists uh, who need a safe environment to provide that rehabilitative support and other youths there also need to be assured of their safety. Mr. Darrell David asked, therefore, whether we have the capability to handle older and bigger built youth and much taller youth in MSF's youth homes. Ms. Rahayu Mazam and Ms. Antia Ong asked about the necessity uh, of mechanical restraints. And I think almost all members raised this issue and I can understand your concern. Like I mentioned yesterday, they will not be used as a punitive measure. But members will appreciate that there are indeed real-life situations where the use of such restraints is necessary to prevent escalation, escape or harm. Let me assure members that the MSF youth homes adopt a range of approaches to de-escalate and manage the use aggressive or violent behaviour when encountered. Youth home staff will attempt to verbally de-escalate tensions, calm down any aggressive residents and persuade them to cease aggressive behaviour. When suitable, the youth homes also use therapy or padded rooms to help calm agitated residents down. If a youth remains aggressive or the situation escalates despite our efforts to calm him down, MSF youth home staff will first verbally issue a warning. And if the youth persists, MSF staff will apply de-escalation techniques based on their training on management of actual or potential aggression, or MAPA, MAPA as mentioned by Ms. Antia Ong yesterday. Only when absolutely necessary will our officers use restraints to manage the resident so as to minimise risk of injury to other residents or staff. And as far as possible, it will be the auxiliary police officers who will do so, but Mr. Louis Ng will understand that in some instances, Given the situation, our officers may also have to respond to take appropriate action for the safety of residents and staff. MSF will put in place stringent procedures and processes in the use of restraints. This includes recording each use of restraint and removing the restraint once the need has passed. Rehabilitation of the youth is important, so after the restraints are removed, an MSF officer will help the resident to process his feelings and, where necessary, a multidisciplinary team comprising the caseworker, psychologist and psychiatrist will also support the youth through this process. Our aim is to provide a safe and secure environment for all residents and staff in MSF youth homes to facilitate rehabilitation. Some members asked about the management of youth of different ages. When we raise the age limit to below 18 at point of admission, some youths may remain in our care or custody till they are about 21 years old. There are various considerations in how we group residents in the MSF youth homes. Their risks and needs are considered. Given the differing levels of maturity, the young ones are generally housed separately from the older youths at the MSF youth homes. As the older youths are at a different stage of development from the existing younger youths, our officers need to have adequate training and experience to address the different risks and needs of older youths. This includes being able to supervise and guide the youths in day-to-day -day activities such as attending educational classes or playing sports in a group setting. This helps the youths to gain soft skills which are important in interacting with youths of different ages. Ultimately, our intent is to facilitate their rehabilitation and reintegration with family and society at large. Many MPs, like Mr Desmond Chu, spoke about providing support for families. In particular, uh, Engineer Dr Lee Biwa, Ms Antia Ong and Ms Denise Poir 
spoke about providing early support for at-risk families before the situation worsens, and, and I fully agree. Vulnerable individuals and families sometimes face complex challenges and require the support of multiple agencies and community organizations to help them regain stability. MSF has been working with our partners to transform our social services, integrate service delivery, and strengthen last mile support. The objective is to provide more comprehensive, convenient, and coordinated support for these families. We have also made significant investment in the early childhood sector to give every child a good start in life and to support families with young children. The Kid Start program provides support for child development, coordinates and strengthens services for families when needed, and monitors the developmental progress of children from birth. Since Kid Start was piloted in July 2016, 1,000 children from low-income families have benefited. We will be expanding Kid Start further, as Prime Minister had announced at National Day Rally, to reach another 5,000 children from low-income households over the next three years. MSF has also worked with schools to conduct parenting programs. We have reached out to 292 schools to make internationally recognized, evidence-based parenting programs available. These will support parents to become more confident in their parenting, reduce parental stress, and better manage negative behavior in their children. Mr. Henry Quack and Professor Lim San San spoke about digital wellness and online addiction. There are programs in the community for families facing such challenges, such as NAMS, or the National Addictions Management Service, which provides treatment for persons with gaming or internet addictions. Community agencies such as Fayue Community Service and touch community services, conduct programs to support children, including teaching them coping strategies to manage their gaming activity. Now, statutory intervention and legal enforcement should not be the only or not be the only or go-to approach. As far as possible, our families should be supported by the community. And where a parent decides ultimately to apply to the youth court for family guidance order, the court can mandate that the child and or the parents can undergo counselling or any other program or treatment to protect well-being. Uh, Ms. Sylvia Lim asked whether families and children have the right to be heard before the youth court. She also wanted to know what options are available for children and families who are unable to engage lawyers. I'd like to first emphasize our starting point that legal recourse ought to be a last resort. And this is why we have programs that divert youth offenders away from the court system and why we're requiring families to attend a mandatory family program before applying for a family guidance order. But for cases that are before the court, it is important to keep the law accessible and easy to understand. There are provisions in the Act and in the Bill to ensure that the, the child's or his parents' voices are heard during proceedings. Section 42 of the CYPA also provides that where a child is brought before the youth court, it is the court's duty to explain the substance of the offence to of the child in language suitable for his age and understanding. Moreover, for child protection cases, MSF caseworkers are guided by the best interests of the child. Similarly, for FGO cases, a counsellor will work with the family through their difficulties. These professionals help to safeguard the interests of the child and the family. Exceptionally, if the presence of lawyers is necessary, there are avenues of assistance available for those who are not able to afford lawyers. They may seek assistance from the Law Society pro bono services or legal clinics run by various community, religious and social service agencies, Criminal legal aid is also available through CLASS, a criminal legal aid scheme, for children and young persons who are accused of a crime or an offence. The Community Justice Centre, or CJC, also assists litigants in person. For example, CJC runs a scheme when an assigned court friend provides practical and emotional support, and the court friend may provide information on court procedures and explain the judge's instructions to the child or parent. 
Mr. Speaker, sir, community partners will play a bigger role in caring for children under our regime. We consulted many stakeholders, including our social service agencies, members of the Youth Advisory Group, and so on. They have told us that they need to build capacity and capabilities to manage both a higher number of children as well as older youths with differing needs and risks. MSF will ensure that all our community partners and our agencies are given sufficient time to work through their plans and processes so that we are collectively ready to implement these changes. MPs such as Ms. Rahayu Mazam, Ms. Louis Ng, Mr. Saktiandi Supat and Mr. Daryl David also spoke about our ability to manage the larger number of children who will be covered under the Act. I assure members we have been planning and working on building capacity and capability to enable us to be ready to implement these changes. The preparations are ongoing but will take time and additional resources. Our community partners have emphasised the need to prepare and to be ready. And this is why we are staggering the implementation of the Bill. We intend to bring into force the amendments to expand care and protection for children first next year, while we seek to amend the CYPA at this sitting to raise the age limit for older youths to be tried by the Youth Court, time will be needed to bring these specific amendments into force as various things need to be put in place first. I have explained that it takes time to strengthen the safety and security within MSF youth homes. We need to make changes to infrastructure to enable age-appropriate rehabilitation and expand the existing academic and vocational curriculum that is provided. We also need to strike the right balance to provide an environment that is safe for residents and staff and conducive for rehabilitation in the youth homes. Ms. Rahayu Mazam and Mr. Louis Ng spoke about the data and research that informs us about our programs and our policies. In the past five years, we have seen more child abuse and neglect cases being reported and investigated. This is in part because of, our, of efforts to increase awareness, such as the Break the Silence campaign, and people have been able to identify cases more easily and to speak out against violence, and better detection of child abuse cases using screening tools and processes. For example, we developed the Child Abuse Reporting Guide, or CARG, that is used by our partners, such as childcare centres, schools and medical professionals, to guide them on what to look out for in detecting child abuse. The overall recidivism rates of our youth offenders have remained stable. We have published a number of research papers covering topics such as family profiles of maltreated children and the predictors of re-entry into the child protection system in Singapore, impact of childhood maltreatment on recidivism in youth offenders and family characteristics linked to youth offenders in Singapore, evaluation of programs such as functional family therapy for youth probationers and violence prevention program for youth offenders, and these are publicly available. The findings inform the work that we do, for example, through the NCPR or the National Committee on the Prevention, Rehabilitation and Recidivism that I co-chair with Minister Josephine Teo from the Ministry of Home Affairs. We will continue to track data and outcomes in relation to abuse, neglect and offending. Mr Deputy Speaker, let me round up by outlining what this bill means for our children families and stakeholders. First, for abused or neglected children, the Bill safeguards their interests by expanding the coverage of the Act to older children. It also enhances our intervention in emotional or psychological abuse cases and provides stable out-of-home care arrangements. Second, for youths who have committed offences, the Bill would help them ease back into their families and society and better support them to avoid further offending. Third, for families that require guidance and parenting, the Bill would help strengthen family relationships and better guide parenting of children. Finally, for stakeholders in community, the Bill also strengthens how we partner them to work with vulnerable children. So the Bill seeks to provide better outcomes for children and break the cycle of abuse, neglect and offending. At the same time, our work with vulnerable children cannot be accomplished by legislation alone. Only when we work collectively as a community can we help our vulnerable children overcome their difficult circumstances to have the best shot in life. I'd like to thank members for their strong support for this bill and I would also like to take this opportunity to put on record our thanks and appreciation to our child protection officers, our youth guidance officers, 
our home staff and APOs, our probation officers, our therapists, psychologists, counsellors, social workers and healthcare workers, our child protection specialist centres, family violence specialist centres, divorce support agencies, family service centres and social work professionals, our youth work integrated service providers, our foster families, our boards of visitors, our advisors of the youth courts, our youth advisory group, our community partners and our volunteers. For the hard work and dedication behind the scenes, often under tremendous pressure, to protect our children, our future, and to guide vulnerable families. I also appreciate the, the policy officers and the legal officers for working hard on this bill. And this bill, if Parliament supports, is the result of their hard work and their recommendations, born out of many years of experience. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'm back to move. Uh, Ms. Sylvia Lim. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, one clarification for Minister. Um, I wonder if he could comment on whether the Ministry observes that cases where the authorities have had to intervene with alternative care arrangements, is this a phenomenon that is uh, predominantly found in those with lower income? And uh, related to that, is there any indication that it is actually a resource issue that has led to these problems? And, and in that sense, support of the family may have to be on a wider basis and perhaps even earlier before these problems arise. Well, I thank the member for, for concern. There are a whole range of issues that may result in uh, MSF and our social service agencies having to intervene uh, to ensure the safety of our children. Uh, and these cases cut across the whole spectrum of society, uh, regardless of SES status. Uh, this includes uh, well-to-do families who may have issues that uh, prevent them from uh, ensuring the safety of their children. Uh, these could include mental health issues. These could include uh, uh, spousal conflict. Uh, these could include uh, uh, neglect or, or lack of parenting focus or skills. So a whole range of issues. Uh, as far as they involve families from uh, lower income backgrounds that may uh, need a lot more assistance, uh, we have programs and schemes to make sure that we pull together the social service agencies, the departments and the community uh, to better support them. The ultimate aim, regardless of the SES of the family concerned, uh, is to ensure that the children are safe and that they can be ultimately reunified uh, with their families. Mr. Lewison. Thank you, sir. Could I just check with Minister whether uh, what the current staff to children ratio is at our children's home, whether we know what an optimum level is, that we have a target that we are trying to reach right now. Uh, second, I, I think Minister did say there's some public data, but I just wanted to confirm that we have data on, on how many children enter our children's home, and then we follow them along the journey, and how many actually end up in the boys' home, how many further along their lives end up being incarcerated. So not from boys' home where there's a criminal element, but uh, from the children's home where sometimes, again, like Eddie's case, where she had to be removed from her family for very good reasons and enter the children's home, how many of those children um, end up in our boys' home and then end up further along the line incarcerated? And lastly, I just want to confirm we are increasing funding support for the VWOs who run our place of safety. In terms of the staff ratio, I don't have that figure. If the member files, I will see whether that data is available. But uh, MSF partners are social service agencies who step forward to run these homes. Uh, as the member will be aware, our focus is less on institutional care with a greater focus on, uh, on family-based care, which is uh, foster care. Nevertheless, there still is a need for institutional care in the form of voluntary children's homes. And as I said, it is a partnership between MSF as well as the social service agencies. That said, MSF provides funding and support uh, to the uh, staff of the social service agencies that run these homes, and we continue to work with them on what is the optimal arrangements to ensure that the needs of every child there is adequately provided for. In terms of data, we do know the number of children that are, are in the various homes, uh, because this is the uh, out-of-home care landscape, uh, whether they are there because it's... Uh, and in some of these homes, youth offenders may also be uh, required to, to, to reside. Uh, as for their trajectory and, uh, the, and recidivism, we do also look at these figures, but whether uh, we have all the data you ask for, this is something I need to look at. As for continued support, I think the member can be assured that we will continue to support our children's homes to ensure that they provide the best possible support for these children.
Ms. Anthea Ong. Thank you, Mr. Deputy <coughs> Speaker. Um, Mr. Can I just check with you? You mentioned earlier that um, the older children and the younger children are actually separated, um, and just from the point of safety. Um, just wondering also, do we separate children that are in the homes uh, because they've been abused and neglected from the children who are in their homes because of offending behaviors? Or are they actually right now mixed um, you know, in the homes together? The member is right that as far as possible, we try to separate children based on age, so the younger children in certain blocks and the older children in other blocks. Uh, as for whether there is segregation of children who are there for care and protection or there because of, of youth offending, uh, that line is, uh, is, is not drawn hard and fast, uh, because often the underlying challenges that result uh, in, the, uh, in them having to reside in these homes are similar. The therapy and support and rehabilitation may be uh, customizable for each child, but overall there are services and programs that are run for all the youth in the home. So there are also uh, uh, needs to ensure uh, optimization of resources uh, so that the children get the support that they need. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thanks, um, Minister. So the concern is whether we are actually monitoring the situation to make sure. I understand that it's not hard and fast in terms of the segregation um, between the children who are there for care and protection and for offending behaviours. Are we looking to make sure that there isn't uh, adverse effects, um, especially of children with offending behaviours, on children who need <coughs> care and protection? I think the member alludes to what they call contamination, especially in the adult prisons uh, situation and, and criminology documents that very well. Uh, certainly in the context of the, uh, the, the MSF youth homes, our aim is to provide a rehabilitative environment. Certainly young people or youth offenders with uh, committed offences uh, may have a different risk profile. Uh, ultimately, the youth guidance officers take a very clear and careful interest uh, in the progress of, of all the children who, are, who have to be in these homes and ensure that uh, negative influences are curtailed as far as possible. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as have that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The Children and Young Persons Amendment Bill. Uh, committee stage what day? Also, I beg to move that, that Parliament do now resolve itself into a committee of the bill. The question is that Parliament will immediately resolve itself into a committee on the bill. As many as have that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clauses 1 to 76 stand part of the bill. As many as have that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Bill to be reported. Uh, Minister. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to report that uh, Parliament has uh, considered the bill in committee. Uh, and, uh, and there are no amendments to the bill. Uh, th third reading, what day? Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg that, Parliament, that, that uh, uh, this bill be, be now read, read a third, third time. time. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the question is that the bill be now read a third time. As many as have that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The Children and Young Persons Amendment Bill.